This is Criminal Behaviorology, a combination of criminology and behavior analysis to assist the criminal and civil justice systems to improve our society in general. A podcast like no other. Here is your host, Timothy Joseph. That's 78 brothers and sisters and sons and daughters, 78. Who couldn't find a single reason to keep going. That's 28 more than this time last year. If we don't do something, we could lose up to 150. 160 airmen in 2019. We can't let this keep happening. This is our problem. And we have to dedicate ourselves every single day to building strong and healthy airmen, supporting and engaging teams and cultures of trust and respect to help keep these airmen hopeful to give him an opportunity to thrive in this great Air Force. That's why General Goldfein has directed this resilience tactical pause, a break in the daily grind so that we can focus, we can focus on our airmen and their well-being. Now, this is not a one-day effort to check a box. This is the beginning of a much-needed dialogue between airmen, command teams, helping agencies, and frankly, our entire Air Force, we have to get this thing turned around. This is your day, so make it your own. We won't tell you what to do. We won't tell you how to do it. You know best what your teams need. Use the resources that we've made available to you, but make it personal. Make it about them, all of them. Most importantly, keep this as a primary focus beyond this pause. Make every single airman count every single day. You know, someone right now in your organization is struggling. Someone in your organization is suffering from post-traumatic stress or depression. Someone in your organization is feeling hopeless. And they may be thinking that suicide is the answer. Give them better options. Let's lead them to a better answer. Okay, and what you just heard there was uh, online, there was a video presented with uh, the August uh, 1st, 2019 in Air Force Magazine. Uh, the U.S. Air Force orders stand down to combat rising suicide rate. The author is Brian Everstein. Now, I'll go over a little bit of the article with you right now. The Air Force units will stand down for one day this summer to address the rising problem of suicides, which Air Force Chief of Staff General David Goldfein said is an adversary that is killing more of our airmen than any enemy on the planet. As of the end of July, 79 suicides had occurred in the Air Force in 2019. The service saw about 100 suicides per year in each of the last five years. Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Khalith Wright, told Airman this week he believes suicide is the biggest problem the service faces. Quote, let's take a moment and breathe and spend a little time on our airmen and their resiliency and make sure we're not missing anything when it comes to suicide and suicide awareness. 
Wright told Air Force Magazine during a visit to Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma this week. Uh, Goldfein penned a letter to commanders explaining the decision to stand down while Wright filmed a video uh, the pause is expected to mirror last year's safety focused stand down. Uh, this time commanders must stop most operations on a day that best suits their mission and gather their units to discuss resiliency and mental health and to ensure airmen are well. Most of the details are up to local commanders, though Air Force Headquarters is providing some re resources. Speaking in the video is Tech Sergeant S Josh Rosales. So, uh, you can maybe see from that in Air Force magazine that came out recently, the problem of suicide in the uh, the Air Force and the military and among veterans and I met uh, up with a psychologist Kent Corso and he had given a, uh, actually several presentations and done some articles on uh, studying Air Force uh, suicides of the active duty and also of suicides of veterans and he had a lot of interesting things to say this has a I think a unique aspect for behavior analysis because we're looking at a very severe problem behavior and we're not always sure what the antecedents are we talk a lot of the psychological uh, terms we use a lot of diagnoses of depression PTSD we maybe take a may behoove us to take a look at what's going on in the environment and what can we affect and maybe we can change things in the environment that affect everyone as opposed to simply trying to narrow down who might be uh, diagnosed with a particular condition or not so uh, Kent is a very uh, animated speaker he had a lot of good things to say and uh, I think I'll just go ahead and let you listen to the interview right about now. Kent, can you tell us uh, a little bit about your your work and your experience? You're with uh, Accelerate Innovations? That's right. So uh, I'm with Accelerate Innovations, and I also have a small uh, private consulting company that is called NCR Behavioral Health, National Capital Region Behavioral Health. Okay. I am a clinical psychologist and a board-certified behavior analyst. I am also a veteran of Operation Enduring Freedom, so I was an Air Force psychologist uh, just after 9-11. Oh. <clears throat> so the majority of my training, as you might imagine, is in the area of suicide and uh, military suicide specifically and PTSD and things like that that are very relevant to the populations of service members who have joined and served after 9-11. And how long did you serve in the Air Force? So I did my residency in the Air Force, which was a year long, and then I owed them a three-year payback providing uh, clinical psychology services. And so it was four years total. I did my initial commitment and then got out. Okay. Well, thank you for your and service since, then. <laughs> go ahead. I'm sorry. I said thank you for your service, but go ahead. I was going to say I appreciate the support. Um, uh -huh. We, I, I got out in 2009 and for the last 10 years have still remained involved mm -hmm. either as a uh, government civilian employee or uh, as a contract uh, provider of contract services to the government. So I still, even though I'm not wearing the uniform, I still remain very active and involved and engaged in the mission um, and mainly in the area of suicide. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and I met you at the old uh, ABAI uh, convention, the last one, which, uh, well, let's see, that was in Chicago, right? Yes, um, and that's right. When I looked it up uh, of some of the things you've done, I, uh, you were at the 44th annual ABAI convention in San Francisco. You had an article, uh, let's see, uh, one of them in 2011, Depression, PTSD, and suicidal ideation among active duty veterans in an integrated primary care clinic. 
and yeah. you were also in the at the Paris France International Conference in uh, let's see 2017. You, it looks like you spoke there as well. Yes, I was part of a presentation that was uh, delivered there. I actually did not attend. Uh, my colleague Abigail Kalkin attended. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so look, yeah, a lot of your work, as you said, has to do with, uh, uh, veterans and suicide prevention. Um, what can you tell us about that subject? Well, where do you want to start? And, um, I could probably talk for about six or seven hours, uh-huh. uh, today about it. Um, you know, I guess that maybe the, the best way to begin is just to maybe set, set out some fundamental concepts. Okay. That I think may not be fully understood, uh, certainly by the behavior analytic community, but also even within the mental health field. Okay. So <clears throat> one of the things we found in our study that you mentioned from 2014 was that, uh, and there are other studies that corroborate this, is that suicide is in and of itself a separate entity. It is not simply a part of depression. Mm-hmm. It is not simply part of what people might call the borderline personality. It is a distinct uh, set of uh, behavioral and cognitive uh, and emotional sequelae that, uh, to be honest, we really still are struggling to understand. There was a meta-analysis published in uh, 2017. The first author's name is Franklin. uh, And they looked at 50 years of suicide research and essentially concluded that our ability to predict suicidal behaviors is nil. It's, it's just oh. poor, <clears throat> which is surprising because you would think that in the last, let's say, 30 to 40 years of contemporary suicidology, uh, which is actually a field, contemporary suicidology, you'd think that we uh, would know more, but it is such a complex problem. Uh, there was another study that came out just earlier this year, and the first author's name is Belcher, B-E-L-S-H-E-R, and they looked at it similarly, but at a population level, and compared the same thing. So at the end of the day, the, the layperson need only look at the specific data from, let's say, 1960 to today, and what you'll see is that we've never had a time in our history, whether we're in America or another country, where the suicide rate has been suppressed and has been uh, sustained at a low rate. Huh. In other words, in other words, in behavioral speak, you don't have any functional control over that variable, mm-hmm. over that behavioral. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kent, have you ever had a, a, a employment or a position where you were in charge of putting people on a suicide watch or taking them off a suicide watch? In the military, I was involved in yeah. those sorts of circumstances, yeah, but... and I was also one of the people having to assist with that, and sort of to keep someone on a watch. Right. Um, to be honest, I have very mixed feelings about it. The, right. the, um, the whole nature of suicide is that it's a sense of hopelessness, powerlessness, helplessness. And I can't think of, of something that reinforces all of those more than having to be watched. Uh-huh. So it's unfortunate, I mean, it's understandable why, particularly in the military, they put people on suicide watch because they are obviously trying to mitigate risk. But the unfortunate part is that it reinforces the idea that I am uh, not even able to keep myself safe. I am hopeless. I am powerless. I am helpless. Uh And what we want to be encouraging people, of course, uh, even in a suicidal state, is of the opposite, that they are empowered, they have uh, free will, they have the uh, strength or the skills to cope with this, or at least the hope that they can do those things. Uh, so, so it's sort of this catch-22 with the suicide watch. <clears throat> and incidentally, when you think about psychiatric hospitalization, that is often considered sort of the uh, best way to manage suicide, sort of if, if all else fails and we're just not sure what to do with this patient, let's send them to the hospital. And the problem with that is that within the hospital, Sometimes it's psychiatric treatment, so pharmacotherapy, but for the most part, uh, there's no aspect of psychiatric hospitalization that directly targets suicidal symptoms. It's, uh, it's instead just keeping people safe. So essentially, it is a suicide watch. Yes. Take away your shoelaces, take away your belt, take away anything you can use to harm yourself, and we're going to remove the opportunity for you to kill yourself. 
Uh-huh. And because of this, it's not surprising that we see 25% of people who are released from hospitals uh, with suicidal thoughts uh, subsequently attempt suicide. Yeah, because I've done that kind of work in corrections where we'd have them on suicide watch and then to make the decision to take them off. And I thought that all right. all it did was it, uh, it uh, encouraged the people to never admit to me again that they had any kind of problem or that they were thinking of harming themselves because they knew what would happen. They just lose all their privileges and just get put in a place where they have no clothes. Right, right. Uh, look, look at Jeffrey Epstein's yes. death a few days yeah. ago, right? I mean, there's a prime example in prison uh, of, of suicide. And I think you made a really good point. And the point is that if we make seeking help for suicide a voice of experience, people are no longer going to raise a flag and, and say, hey, I need some help with this. And so there's got to be a better way to assist people without making it so aversive uh, so that they avoid it in the future, right? Right. And that, yeah, that Epstein case just goes to the, uh, you have somebody that had so many indicators. I believe he'd, he'd attempted it previously. And uh, he was all, right. yeah, and it, it ends up happening I, anyway. Go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, it, it ends up, I mean, it, their, their efforts at Suicide Watch did not prevent this uh, from occurring. Right, right. I don't, and I don't know if he had a prior attempt. I know he was on a prior suicide okay, watch yeah. and had come off of it. Okay. So, and, and to, to your point, I mean, that may have taught him exactly what he needed to say uh-huh. to no longer be on the watch, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. He may have been put on a watch. He understood now how they would handle it and then said, okay, well, I'm going to tell them that I'm feeling fine now. And then uh, the next time I'm, you know, once they back off, then I will actually have the means to kill myself. Who knows, yeah. right? Right. That's what happens when you punish someone or something. They just know how to avoid the punishment in the future. Yes, that's right. My um, my favorite book I ever read in graduate school was by Murray Sidman mm-hmm. called Coercion and its Fallout. Uh-huh. Uh, my absolute favorite book I ever had to read in it, and it's all, that kind of a tenet is listed in that book, that when you punish the person or people who would administer the punishment, of course, represent that punishment and that that person then gets avoided. Right. Right. Uh, I'm hearing, uh, and when I read through some of this literature, um, that, uh, the military has some 22 veterans commit suicide per day. Is that an accurate uh, figure you think? It is. And they, they, they typically, provide a range. They've said 19 to 22. Mm-hmm. And the reason why is due to some variability in the data, due to some difficulties confirming some things. And then also some to, to say something was a um, death by suicide, in most cases we have some clarity, but there are some, some times where it's fuzzy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then at the, and on the other hand, we also don't know about all of the Mm-hmm. The suicides, because only 50% of our veterans actually get treatment through the VA. Mm-hmm. The other 50% either don't have any benefits or they get it privately through some other third party payer. Right. And if I could point one thing out, Tim, um, very respectfully, whenever I'm, I spend a lot of time teaching and training uh, various types of professionals about suicide, assessing it, managing it, or just understanding it. Mm-hmm. And uh, both from an individual level, if I'm a clinician or a behavior analyst or a psychologist or a physician, but also at a system level. If I'm, I've done a lot of work with the state of Idaho and in, in helping them with their suicide prevention program. So at a population level, how do we sort of attack this problem? And one thing that, that I, I like to share is the word commit we try to avoid saying commit suicide. Okay. Do you know why that might be? Um, I'm not sure. I guess it sounds pretty... <laughs> I'm going to let you uh, answer that one. Okay. Um, there are only two things generally people commit, and it's crimes uh-huh. and sins. And so uh-huh. uh, other than being committed, let's say in a relationship, when we say they committed suicide... It's making a judgment uh-huh. uh, or value laden uh, statement. It sort of comes along with some value or judgment attached to it. So, we, when I'm 
um, working with folks or even doing podcasts like this, I'll say the person died by suicide. He ended his life. She killed herself. We try to avoid using the word commit suicide. Mm-hmm. So just a just a tip. And survivors of suicide attempts will will concur that they uh-huh. appreciate that difference. Yeah. It's uh, it's it's kind of a the the word has a certain connotation to it that can be pretty negative. Right, yeah. right, exactly. Uh, no, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, what would you say are the uh, what can we? Is there anything on the demographics of those uh, veterans or active duty military personnel that commit suicide? Their ages, their ranks is there any details about them that is that can give us some insight absolutely so the the demographics <clears throat> among those who died by suicide of the military and who are veterans are the same demographics we see in the civilian world it's typically white males ages 18 to 25 and then there's sort of this big jump once you get over 65 and mm-hmm. the problem is, and this sort of ties into that meta-analysis I mentioned that, that was done by Franklin and colleagues in 2017, the problem with data like these are that they don't help us to predict anything. They don't, mm-hmm. We've known this sort of profile, if you will, of, of a suicide person. We've known this profile for decades, mm-hmm. but it's never helped us prevent suicides. And so... In the work I do, I've done a lot of work recently with the Air National Guard, and in the work I've done with them, really trying to emphasize that that it's great to know those, but it's not been effective at a in a prevention uh, uh-huh. strategy or, or effort. Uh-huh. So we have to go beyond that and start looking at what are other predictors, and 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 not even not even looking at it from what's the rest of the profile that we don't know, but rather getting far upstream from that. And upstream from that is sort of uh, what is suicide all about? Well, suicide is a state of ambivalence. People have reasons for living and reasons for dying. Mm -hmm. When we talk to most patients who are suicidal, they don't truly want to die. Mm -hmm. The ones who truly want to die either never make it to our office or our, our exam room or our hospital or our clinic. They're already dead. Mm-hmm. Right. So either they truly want to die and so they don't seek help, they just quietly go kill themselves, or they are determined and resolved to die, but the timing isn't right. They want to make sure that, I don't know, a child graduates college or mm-hmm. that they sell their car, that they retire, some, some sort of closure uh, or event or something that they're looking to, to ask that is done, then they are, are sort of ready to kill themselves. But the minority of the cases we see, the vast majority of people who we will ever speak to who who suicide are ambivalent. And the evidence for that is the mere fact that they're alive and in front of us. Mm -hmm. Okay, And getting people to understand that ambivalence is is really the first step. And we know that uh, uh, behavioral health providers, mental health, psychiatric, even behavior analysts, all different types of helping professions out there, including physicians and nurses, they are able to help someone when that person raises a flag. But why should we wait that long? And so that's sort of the approach we've tried to take with some of our work in the military. Um, and when I say us, I mean Accelerate Innovations. We've tried to go upstream even further and say, okay, once someone raises a flag, the mental health folks or the medical folks will be able to handle it. But why don't we try to increase the reasons for living? Mm-hmm. We can't solve their reasons for dying. And if, if again, if suicide is about reasons for living and reasons for dying, let's beef up the reasons for living. And in a military sense, we know that people join the military for a handful of very common reasons, collect these data, basic training and recruitment contexts. They want to either travel, they want educational benefits, they want some other sort of life stability, and generally they want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Mm-hmm. And so all of those things are reasons to live. So why not, if we're talking about uh, a suicide prevention program that is very closely tailored to the culture and the culture's values and priorities, why aren't we focusing on uh, increasing their opportunities to do all those things uh, as sort of a, a population preventative strategy so everyone gets it, mm-hmm. so that fewer people flow downstream uh, or you know, become suicidal? Mm-hmm. And how can you, so basically we're talking about you know, reinforcing reasons to live. How can we do that, especially like if if we don't know who the 
who it is that may be uh, wanting to end their own life? How can we reinforce wanting to live? Right, right. No, good question. So from a military perspective, the commanders of each, the commander of each unit has an immense amount of power, control, and responsibility and authority over the troops. Right. And so if we can get the commander uh, speaking to and providing opportunities for all unit members, we're not looking to target only those at risk because, again, targeting the profile at risk has not helped us. So let's target everyone so that over time we're preventing some people who started to go in one direction, we will prevent them from doing it. And obviously others who are already there, you know, it may help compete with their reasons for dying. But the goal is is to deliver this to everybody. So in that sense, it's, sense it's a very traditional public health or population health program. In the same way, everyone gets the flu shot, right? Right. But what we have is people who are elderly, infants, and those who are immunocompromised, they get it first. Mm-hmm. So the, the, looking at that program as an analogy, everyone would get these commanders' uh, lecture, the commander's encouragement, the opportunities the commander can provide for, uh, you know, enjoying life in the military. But then those who are at higher risk, who we know whether they're going through a divorce or having legal troubles, occupational troubles, maybe they're in the demographic brackets, they will get more, something that maybe has to do with directly about suicide and about, hey, if you're feeling this way, here's how you can uh, here's what you can do to, to work with it uh, independently, and here are the other resources available that you can go access in order to address it. Hmm. Uh, you, you know, just speaking off the cuff, this uh, I, it sounds similar to uh, I, a couple of months ago we had a podcast with Frank Straub, uh, who was a, a former police officer, and he'd done a study on on preventing school attacks. And yes. it sounds similar about having a school that's supportive, that is uh, uh, reaching out, that is uh, wanting the best for the kids. Uh, he spoke spoke a lot of those kind of positive things to the entire group because we don't necessarily yes. know who's going to do the school attacks. If we did, we'd take action. Um, so we apply it to the whole group, what we can do. That's exactly right. I know Frank Waller. He's done some excellent work. And, and, and you're right. It is a similar approach. It's sort of deliver the, the proactive measures to everyone and then see what happens. Of course, we always have those reactive or responsive measures, mm-hmm. right? Treatment and ER and mental health right. treatment. But, but he's been focusing on that side and not getting upstream and delivering something proactive to the whole group. Okay. Uh, if we use the term suicidal ideation, uh, mm-hmm. what basically does that refer to? So, good question. This is something that is frequently uh, confused among even licensed mental health providers. Uh, suicidal ideation means wanting to die, and, and this is the critical piece, seeing yourself play some sort of a role in enacting your death. Uh-huh. So, we know that about 50% of mental health programs have formal training on suicide, both here and in Canada. So that's psychology, psychiatry, social work. Uh, I'm sorry, not psychiatry. Psychology, social work, mental health counseling. We also know that the average duration of that training is about 90 minutes. When the entire field is looking to us to handle suicidal patients, uh-huh. and we only have, you know, half of us have 90 minutes of training, <laughs> that's a problem. Yeah. So... So one of the most commonly misunderstood terms is what's called death ideation and suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. We used to hear terms like passive ideation or active ideation. Those are no longer used because they don't really hold up empirically. Uh Uh, What does hold up empirically is a differentiator between those who subsequently attempt suicide and those who don't is either just thinking of death and dying, which we call death ideation, it's also called non-lethal morbid ideation. Hmm. And then, of course, suicidal ideation. So one of the first things that, that it's important for a, a clinician to do or a professional to do is, are you thinking of just death and dying, or are you thinking of, of helping to facilitate that? Mm-hmm. And if it's the latter, then we need to get we need to have some, a more in-depth conversation. Mm-hmm. People who, ha- who have suicidal ideation reliably... Uh, act on that ideation compared to people of death ideation where they don't 
don't reliably act on that. So, so to have death ideation is not a predictor necessarily of subsequent suicidal behavior. Interesting. Uh, is there a, do we have a relationship of these mental health conditions like depression and post-traumatic stress disorder with suicidal ideation? Do you find a connection there? So there is, so there is a, uh, because depression involves uh, hopelessness, life that is purposeless or meaningless, we would expect that a subset of those who are depressed begin to think about death and ending their lives. And that's sort of a slam dunk. But even outside depression, suicidal ideation exists. So there's certainly a relationship between depression and suicidal ideation, but it's not an exclusive one mm -hmm. because suicidal ideation can also rise uh, in people who are not depressed, but just are, the best way to say it is sort of poorly developed mm -hmm. from, a, from a social and emotional perspective. People who do not have, they're not socially adept, they don't have strong self-esteem, uh, they uh, may have tumultuous relationships, they may have uh, some distorted perceptions about how others are treating them and, 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 or why they're being treated a certain way by others. And in those cases, that can sometimes be a reason to say, well, I've got nothing to live for, or I would be better off dead. Uh, mm -hmm. And then with PTSD, <clears throat> there isn't a formal relationship between PTSD as a diagnosis and suicide, but we do have data, uh, at least in the military, that the, the more traumatic events one is exposed to, the higher likelihood of having some suicidal thoughts. Right. So it's more about... Um, not surprisingly, for people who are behaviorists, <laughs> um, the more the environment is one that is traumatic, the more uh, likely we will to have uh, a person will be to have um, uh, suicidal thoughts. Is there a connection with traumatic brain injury and suicide or suicidal ideation? So I don't know of a study that's examined that specifically. It doesn't mean it's not out there. But what we do know is that people with TBIs, and I think since 9-11, the, the cohort of folks who have been in the military since 9-11, we hear a lot about suicide, PTSD, and TBI. They're sort of the trifecta of what some people call the invisible wounds of war. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing a higher incidence of TBIs because... People are surviving uh -huh. uh, physical trauma that historically they would not have survived. So mm -hmm. because it's, uh, because we a battlefield medicine is so advanced, and within hours of someone, let's say, being blown up in their Humvee, they're able to be uh, medically evacuated through a helicopter, then a C-130 over to Germany, and they're able to be treated so quickly. Uh, not only are we stabilizing people better at the point of injury, but then we're able to get them to a higher level of care quicker. So they're surviving more lethal encounters. Mm -hmm. So because of that, that, that would be the only explanation for any relationship between TBI and suicide is someone who has a TBI may have encountered more traumatic encounters, more lethal encounters. Mm -hmm. And so it's probably more closely related to having encountered traumatic events than, than anything else. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh... Uh, why uh, study? Uh, let's see. Why study the Air Force in regards to uh, suicide as opposed to other branches? Or maybe there's a there's a very practical reason for that. Can you tell us? Sure. Uh, <laughs> there's a non-practical one. There's okay. a sort of a. I was in the Air Force, so I'm a little bit biased. I, I have an uh -huh. appreciation and a love for the Air Force, uh -huh. uh, and I did deploy with the Army. So I, you know, so very respectful of all services, but I'm a little biased because I was in the Air Force. That's sort of one reason. But the real main reason is that they started collecting data before the other services did. Uh -huh. The Air Force has had a robust suicide prevention program since 1985. They've worked with Dr. Kerry Knox up at uh, University of Rochester, I believe, um, uh, who is a uh, MPH. We worked with her for years. Uh, and so because they have the most rich data repository, uh, we were most confident that, that that would be helpful to answering some questions and drawing some conclusions. Mm -hmm. So they, they started before the other branches, and they've done, uh, they've, it's a really good source of data. Correct. Yeah. Uh, have the suicide rates uh, increased since 
deployments that came after 2001. Um, do you have data to, to suggest that? We do. We, do. we see, we see uh, definitely see an increase in the suicide rates after uh, 9-11. One of the complexities with all of this is that suicide is a low base rate phenomenon, uh-huh. meaning that it, even though it's still one of the top 10 causes of death in America among adults, and it's the number two cause of death among uh, children and adolescents, uh-huh. it, it's still actually not that many when you look at the raw numbers. Uh-huh. They have to find these sort of ratios to use in order. It, it requires statistical power. That's that way. Uh-huh. And so they look at it. Generally, the, the scientists look at it as the rate per 100,000 people. And what we see is that it, it started increasing uh, after 9-11, but the real sharp upward turn is after 2005. 2005 was sort of a breaking point in many ways. Not only uh, did it involve the Battle of Fallujah, which was a, we took uh, some significant casualties, but also very intense and tumultuous. Um, but also by 2005, we'd been at war for four years and had figured out that two years is not a reasonable amount of time to deploy troops. Uh-huh. And we needed and there it was having significantly uh, detrimental effects on their health and mental health. We needed to start changing the way we did deployments. Mm-hmm. So in 2005, the Army uh, was still deploying people potentially for two years at the time, one to two years, and some people were, were doing four and five deployments. So, so I think they were sort of learning that happened among the military leaders to say, okay, here's what people can handle and then come and recover from and then redeploy. And they settled on the six months to, to 12 months. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so I think that there was sort of some just lessons learned the first four years of the war that, that are partly responsible for why in 2005 we see sort of a, an upturn. Hmm. Uh, are the estimates for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, about the same for the troops returning from Vietnam and from Iraq and from Afghanistan? Well, I don't, <clears throat> I don't have a good answer for that. It's not, it's, it's complex because our diagnostic criteria change over time. Now, certainly when we look at World War II, mm-hmm. those criteria are the most different, you know, triple shock, right? Those are the most different than Vietnam and, and after. Um, the, the problem is that the older the veterans are, the harder it is to keep track of them. Remember that only 50% of veterans are used in the VA. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's really hard to compare it by cohort according to war or when you deploy. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have to say one thing that's unique of the cohort of Vietnam vets is, well, let me say it this way. What's unique about the post-9-11 vets is the, the general public seems to be able to recognize that even if you didn't support the war, you needed to support the truth. Right. And so... Uh, that was, I think, something we learned from Vietnam, because in Vietnam we had people spitting at veterans, uh, shouting at them, cursing at them. So the reason that's so psychologically damaging is because when someone is in what's called theater, in the theater of war, they're downrange, they're in a deployed setting, some of the things they mentally rely on to, to sort of keep going and persisting and trying are things like, I'm doing this for my country, uh, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be helping people, you know, mm-hmm. my family, my friends, they'll be proud of me. Mm-hmm. So when you consider that during Vietnam, that's what sort of helped those service members hold themselves together mentally and emotionally, and they came back and none of those things actually happened. Mm-hmm. It's a real mind bender. It's a real mm-hmm. sort of twist. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that's why the Vietnam era veterans struggle particularly is that they yeah. uh, really held it together uh, for certain reasons, but then those reasons didn't play out. They actually got the opposite. So, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, thankfully we've learned. <laughs> yeah. So it's the uh, the after effect of the war and how the the country deals with it then is a factor in and of itself. Right. Right. Uh-oh. And and, I, and that's also <clears throat> part of the reason why our approach uh, within the state of Idaho and with the Air National Guard is to really reach out to everyone, not just look at those who are at risk, because the people who are currently not at risk might someday be at risk. So yeah. let's really try to reach everyone uh, so that we can be working smart, not just hard, right? yeah. because even the public response to maybe shape impressions about suicide or re-educate people uh, in a way that ends up serving them, not just their, their fellow citizens.
Mm -hmm. uh, do military suicides exceed the rate for civilian suicides? So the data are mixed, but in general, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the data varies a little bit by service branch, Marines and Army versus Navy and, and Air Force. Uh, historically, the Marines and the Army have the highest suicide rates. That's partly because they're often the tip of the spear. They're in there first. They're on the ground. Um, so they're seeing the most intense combat. They are uh, the first ones in, so they're in it, and they are up against the highest odds. When you think of the Air Force, especially with... Um, drones and sort of unmanned vehicles, unmanned aircrafts, or like a video game. Now, we certainly see PTSD in those folks, but we don't see as much of the suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the answer, the, the easy answer is yes. Mm -hmm. and, and just as I think about this now, like we're talking about the changes in in PTSD and how we conceive of it and how it's it's accepted is... Uh, is it that you think more veterans or military personnel are willing to come forward and admit that, yeah, I have symptoms of this of this post-traumatic stress disorder, um, when before that was much more uh, not, they, they would feel ashamed or feel uncomfortable coming forward and saying they have these symptoms? Well, we've definitely decreased stigma to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's for certain. Um, but there's also, I think there's been more uh, public awareness about mental health problems in general. And, right. and, and the, it seems that people, the public perception is that it's more common. Whereas if we went back to the 1950s or 60s and said, how common do you think it is to have some behavioral health concerns? People would probably answer that it's very uncommon or it must mean that you're weak or it must mean that you mm -hmm. are broken or damaged. And that's not really the connotation that, that we have anymore. Certainly, mm -hmm. some people still have it. I mean, you have what's the Army tagline, Army Strong. Right. So it's hard to convince uh, a soldier that Army Strong, and even if you have PTSD, you can still be strong. Uh, but, but, um, but, yeah, I think it's what you say. It's increased awareness and also some destigmatization that we've been able to impart mm -hmm. over the last several decades. Uh, what could we say are the the system level factors in regards to suicide in the in a military setting? So uh, that pertains to some of the work we did, Accelerate Innovations did with the uh, Air National Guard. So what we did was look at those individual factors like a recent marital uh, mm -hmm. problem or legal or job problem. We looked at what are those. Uh, variables that the entire military community is exposed to. We studied 10 specific wings. Each wing had anywhere from 500 to 1,000 people. Mm -hmm. I think our total sample size was 5,600, which is the largest survey I think that's ever been administered to the military in a suicide prevention study. And <clears throat> what we found is that things like accountability, unit accountability, mm -hmm. were, were related to decreased suicide risk. Uh, we learned that group cohesion and having a sense of meaning and purpose mm -hmm. is uh, related to decreased risk for suicide. That's not surprising. There are quite a few studies out there supporting that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other things we found is something that we called centrality. So in the Air National Guard, 95% of the suicides are among people who are only there for one weekend a month and two weeks during the summer. Mm hmm only 5% of the suicides are among uh, traditional, uh, not drill, full-time guardsmen. So those are the people who are there sort of full-time. And so the, the question became, well, wait a minute. If 95% of the suicides are among people who are only impacted by the military one, one weekend a year and two, two weeks during the summer, how can we either be perpetuating or... Right. solving a suicide problem with that little exposure to these people. Uh -huh. And so when so it's not just about time though. It's about an emotional commitment, a mental commitment, a commitment to, you know, in terms of one's life, one's occupation. Uh -huh. And so some of the data we gathered was how central is it, you know, is your service and your time in the Air National Guard is that central to your life? And among those uh for whom it was central you know, that was telling, you know, to have the Air National Guard be a central experience to them was actually uh, sort of a risk decrease or a risk buffer. In addition, 
one of the risk factors that at the system level we found is that it has to do with expectations. So is life in the Air National Guard what you expected it to be? Mm-hmm. And for those who's for those whom had their expectations exceeded or met, they were at low risk for suicide. But mm-hmm. for those whose expectations were not met, they were at a higher risk. Mm-hmm. So, so you might be thinking, Tim. Okay, well, what's the, how are those data actionable? What are the next steps a commander or military leaders can take? Mm-hmm. Well, it's really simple. It's making sure everyone has, let's say, an annual performance appraisal. So right. it's making sure that during that performance appraisal, someone, some superior, uh, non-commissioned or commissioned officer, asks the person, "Are your expectations being met?" And it's not that we're going to change the Air National Guard to meet your expectations but we need to have at least a conversation mm-hmm. that addresses your expectations. And if they're not being met, what kind of a professional plan can we set out here in terms of goals for career advancement mm-hmm. or career change mm-hmm. that will better meet your expectations? Are your expectations realistic? What is realistic? So, so you know, it goes back to a very, very fundamental basic concept that, that is when people know what they're getting, uh, they're generally okay with it. Mm-hmm. When people don't know what they're getting or they've devoted a lot towards something and don't get what they thought, uh-huh. that's, that doesn't feel good. That, that's not something that is uh, fulfilling and, and uh, you know, they're more likely to have thoughts of death or, or suicide, particularly if there are other things going on that are uh, risk factors, like the individual ones. Is there something to be said for, uh, let's say, learning to be happy with what you have? Absolutely. Yeah. I think you know, what, what we know from a lot of the acceptance and commitment therapy literature uh-huh. is that having a flexible cognitive style and uh-huh. thinking flexibly is probably the most adaptive thing humans can do. Uh-huh. Uh, and so I think your point is well taken. So if you find a way to be happy with what you have or find a solution to be happier by doing different behaviors or activities or making different commitments, mm-hmm. those are adaptive responses. Mm-hmm. But to sort of self-destruct or implode when one's expectations are not met, that's obviously mm-hmm. uh, not, not, the, not the best way. <clears throat> Maybe it's kind of hard for people uh, to take a behaviorist view with suicide because it, it's an act and then the person's life ends, but suicidal ideation or suicidal behavior in general, it seems like it can be shaped just like any other kind of behavior, it, it doesn't. We we just don't necessarily see all the incremental levels that lead up to that final act. We we mean when a person is thinking, "Oh, I I've, I'm a failure at what I set out to accomplish. I've let these people down. I've let maybe my country or my a fellow people I serve with down." That we don't see all those thoughts that they may be going through, but it is. It is something that builds up to that point, and it's also something that can be those kinds of suicidal thinking and behaviors can be reduced or eliminated through new behaviors. Is that I rambled a little bit there, but is that you see what I'm saying? I think that's exactly right, Tim. If, if I could drill down one layer deeper, what we're talking about is shaping inner behaviors, right? And if we have a, a chain of inner behaviors that result in a behavioral uh, suicidal behavior or an attempt or a rehearsal or a behavior to prepare for suicide, if we have a chain of, of inners that lead to that, then we need to mitigate the chain way up the chain early as possible. And so one of the places where we know that, uh, for example, there's a few studies that came out last few years looking at crisis response plans. Let me be clear, a crisis response plan is really just helping someone find an alternative way of coping with those inner behaviors. You know that that reduces suicide, suicidal attempts up to 73%. Okay. We don't even see, we don't even see data like that for treating depression in some populations. So, uh-huh. so uh, these are pretty compelling data, and they're coming out of the University of Utah. A good friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Craig Ryan, is the director for the National Center for Veteran Studies, and that's where some of this data, data are coming out of. And although it's a cognitive behavioral approach, what I think many in the behavior analytic community overlook is that if an approach works, it must be operating by behavioral tenants, otherwise it uh-huh. wouldn't be effective. Uh-huh. So rather than throwing out cognitive behavioral treatments that are successful, we should be translating them into more of a stricter behavioral speak 
to understand the active ingredients, the functional components, and to be able to deliver them in a more efficient way. And so, to your point, if we what we know about those inners is if we can get into the process and intervene with that ambivalence, someone is saying, I have reasons for living and reasons for dying. If we can get into their inner dialogue by seeing with them and get them to sort of put those pros and cons on a scale and, and, and look at those suicidal thoughts in the context of what their values are and their priorities, we find that most people don't want to die. They just don't want to live with their pain. Mm -hmm. And so if we can help alleviate the pain, most people want to live. And that's the thing. Suicide is an escape-oriented behavior. The function of the behavior is to avoid pain, to escape pain. So if we can help people decrease pain so it doesn't need to be avoided with such a terminal or final decision or action, then they come back from it and they, they sort of turn around. Uh, well, Kent, you, uh, you've said, uh, so much and I, I, I think I told you half an hour and so we made it to 45 minutes. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it sounds like there's so much more we could talk about on this issue. Uh, that's why I really want to have you back on the podcast, um, in the near future, if we can arrange it. Uh, Sounds great, Tim. I'd be, I'd be happy to do that. This is a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, so uh, what are you going to be at the next uh, ABAI uh, convention? I think it's in D.C., isn't it? I will. It's, it's here in D.C. I'm in Northern Virginia, but it's here in town. So, yes, I will definitely be there. Just um, I'll also be at the uh, Society for Standard Acceleration. Their conference is in St. Pete's in November. Excellent. Uh, anything else we can add before we sign off, Kent? No, other than thank you so much for having me, and I really appreciate your interest in this topic. Yeah, and, and thank you for the for the work you're doing. I think it's going to be uh, th this is an area where uh, another area where behavior uh, analysts can get involved and and make a direct difference. I mean, if we actually s could do something to to save lives, um, uh, that that's going to really uh, not that the other areas we work in aren't important, but this can be just as important as anything behaviorists do. Without a doubt, we need more behaviorists in this sort of work. They are the perfect type of yeah. uh, professional to be uh, saving lives. And if I could just put a plug in for the SIG, the Military and Veterans uh -huh. SIG, which we've been established for about seven or eight years now. So if you're not familiar, look for us on Facebook or uh, look for our annual meeting at the conference. So that's the Military and Veterans Special Interest Group with the uh, Association for Behavior Analysis uh, International. International. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you so much, Kent. Hey, you're welcome, Tim. Take care. Facebook page and other social media sites.